a keeper of the cup since 1989. You can follow him on Twitter at Keeper of the Cup. He has 88,000 followers. Philip Pritchard. And a keeper of the cup since 1997, Walter Newbread. And we have with us a two time winner of the Stanley Cup from your Chicago Blackhawks, number 65, Andrew Shaw. Nicely done. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here. I want to ask all of you how you first became associated with the Stanley Cup. Andrew, we know how you became associated with it by winning it. But uh, let's start with you, Philip. Uh, when did you take on the job as keeper, and, and how did you become aware of it? Uh, it was 1988, actually. I was employed at the Hockey Hall of Fame. Wasn't even born yet. And my. Uh, <laughs> first week on the job, I had to go up to Newmarket, Ontario, which is just north of Toronto, with the Stanley Cup, and it kind of, it's kind of grown from there, I guess. How about, how about you, Walter? I actually had pictures on Phil and blackmailed him. <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was working at the hall in 1997, and the job came open, and Phil asked me if I'd like to do it, and I thought about it for about a half a second and said yes. And uh, the first person I took the cup to was Scotty Bowman. And that was, uh, keeps coming back to him. <laughs> Howie, how about you? Uh, almost 12 years ago, I started off uh, as a volunteer uh, working the induction night at uh, Hockey Hall of Fame and uh, started working some part-time hours and then traveled with the other trophies and artifact displays to different uh, tournaments and special events. And then about six years ago, Phil asked me if I was available to help out with the cup and uh, it's been a great experience since. And my very first player I got to travel with with the cup was uh, Jonathan Taze. Great guy to start off with. Nicely done. Mike, your story? Yeah, I started working at the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1995. Uh, I worked in the Special Events Department and uh, in the Museum of the Hockey Hall of Fame. And uh, It was in early 2000. Uh, my boss told me she, I was up for this job and that Phil was going to come and talk to me about it. And I kind of asked, how do I prepare for this interview? And she says, don't worry about it. And Phil asked me one day, do you got a minute? And went into his office and said, hey, would you like to be one of the cup keepers? And I said, sure. <laughs> and here I am, 16 years later, still doing it. So it's been a lot of fun. And, my first player was Randy McKay from the New Jersey Devils. So explain a little bit about the day-to-day -day job. First of all, it sounds like this is a really coveted job. I mean, when, when the job comes open, all of you had connections to the Hall of Fame, and uh, do guys jump at the opportunity to do this job? And Mike, what goes into it? What's the day-to-day -day regimen like? Well, uh, it, during, the, during the season, we have a lot of events lined up to the uh, National Hockey League and the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, we do uh, a variety of charity events. We work with our corporate partners. Uh, the Cup's on, close, on the road about 320 days a year. Uh, the winning team gets 100 of those days, and uh, all the guys up here uh, will travel with it during the summer. Uh, I was actually uh, with Andrew Shaw uh, last week with it up in Belleville, Ontario, and a, a, a day starts... Uh, basically about 8 o'clock in the morning, and after that, it's kind of in the players' hands and what they do, and maybe Andrew could talk about what he did on his day, and we're there the whole entire time. Phil, is there a rotation? How do you divvy up the, the days and the hours? <clears throat> yeah, you know what? I mean, I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but the team gets 100 days with the Stanley Cup, basically from the night they win until home opener, and we try and divvy up the, uh, the schedule depending on where everybody's from. This year, we're going to be in uh, all across U.S., Canada, Finland, Sweden, Czech Republic, and Slovakia with all the players and obviously the coaching staff and management and all that. But we try and work it out so the guys don't get, uh, they're not on the road for that long, but we can make it work so everyone has a great day. I remember texting back and forth with Andrew on his day, and his comments were, well, we're going to start off at my house, and we're going to just go to the lake, and that's going to be about it. 
So obviously you read between the lines and there's a bit more than that, but you know, as Mike said, it all works out. And uh, here we are, it's uh, traveling back all over the place. Tomorrow Walt and I are heading to Finland for the three fins from the Blackhawks. So it never stops. Let's get back to your day, Andrew, with the cup, because I, I saw that among other things, the cup made an appearance at a wedding. Can you tell us how that came about? Well, uh, my sister was a part of the wedding party, so she was over there all day. It was actually on the other side of the, the lake where I grew up, so we got on my boat. Uh, we went over there to surprise the bride, took a few pictures with them, and got a family picture uh, with my whole family as well. So, you know, it was nice. Uh, I think it made that day just a little bit more special for her as well. That's the true wedding crasher. The movie's the secondary. <laughs> this is the true one. <laughs> But well, there was another wedding this week, right here in, in Bolingbroke, I think. There, I saw pictures of a couple getting married by the cop uh, on, on television. So well, you, you have a lot, of, a lot of big events like this when you're traveling with the cop, people getting married, all kinds of uh, different family events. There was, uh, I don't know even know if they're here, there was a couple, the guy just proposed to his girlfriend up in the, in the other room. Is he here at all? I don't know. Here today? Yeah, like a, an hour and a half ago, he got down on one knee in front of the cup, so it's... <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if she said yes, though. I, <laughs> I hope so. Um, but there are, you know, you never know where you're going to take the cup. There's all sorts of different things we do, and, and people say, you know, where's the weirdest place you've taken it? And it's kind of like, I don't know what's weird anymore, because we go all over the place with it, and we do all sorts of different things. So you, you never know, and that's kind of the neat nature of the job. Do you, Howie, do you, do you worry when the cup is alone? When you're, when, I don't know, you have to leave it at, at a hotel or it's not we, in your We possession. worry when Howie's alone if you've seen his leg. <laughs> Walt sleeps with it in his arms. I know that. I, I know Andrew does. Andrew, I, I've seen some things I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> We've got a pact here. Well, one thing you might not know about Walt is he can't swim. And he came to my cup party in 2013 and we almost sunk a boat. That was, Andrew's, that was Andrew's relative who almost sank the boat. <laughs> See, those are the things that never make the newspaper. Yeah. Sorry, Howie. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, to be honest, the cup isn't really left alone all that often, uh, you know, because of the long days. And uh, we go to, to as many events as we possibly can, I guess, uh, whether we're with a player or uh, maybe, uh, you know, somebody from the... Uh, the management or the coaches or equipment managers, stuff like that. Uh, there's always a, a long list of things to do and try to get the cup to as many people as possible so that they can uh, enjoy their, you know, 30 seconds of, uh, you know, fame with the cup. But uh, at, at night, the cup comes back to the hotel with us and we have to prepare it every night uh, for the next day and we wash it and clean it and, uh, you know, get ourselves ready too uh, so we can, uh, you know, get out there and uh, let everybody, you know, experience the cup. It's just one of those things that's amazing. I never uh, seem to get tired of watching the reaction that uh, I see when everybody sees it for the first time. The, the eyes get wide, the smiles get bigger, everybody's just really happy to see it. So we just try to do our best to uh, get it out there and uh, you know, have as many people as possible uh, see it. Mike, the tradition of, of everybody having a day with it, and I didn't realize this till recently, but it, it, it's a fairly recent development, isn't it? it it's, it's not a tradition that goes back to the, the early days of the sport. Uh, no, it's not. It actually started in 1995. Uh, the New Jersey Devils were the first team to have it uh, accompanied with a cupkeeper. Uh, prior to that, in the 80s and into the early 90s, it kind of evolved in what goes on today. Uh, there were guys in the 80s and 90s that may have brought it home. Uh, or, you know, for example, the Islanders in the 80s spent time with it on Long Island. Uh, but, you know, after a few things had gone wrong and, and the NHL really didn't like what was happening, they decided to incorporate our job for we keep an eye on it, put some rules with it, and let the guys have some fun, and, and now it travels all over the world, and uh, it's probably one of the greatest traditions in sports. Uh, you don't see it in any other sport, uh, trying, you know, to bring their iconic trophy home and share it with their friends and family, and uh, I know some sports are trying to do it, but it just doesn't have the same kind of meaning when you bring the Stanley Cup home, and uh, again, I think it's one of the greatest traditions right now in sports. Uh, Andrew, obviously, you've gotten to know these guys pretty well here since uh, 2013, and they've, they've been around. We've seen them around since, since 2010. Uh, so, I mean, you 
clearly you know Walt and, and you get to know these guys. The players develop a, a relationship with these guys because they're around you when you have your day with the Cub. I mean, when you win three Cups in six years, I'm sure you're going to you know, make some friends at the Hockey Hall of Fame. But uh, yeah, these, these guys are great. You know, uh, they give up their free time in the summer to, to come you know, spend the day with us and uh, you know, see what it's like around our hometown and you know, get to experience the, our Cup Day with us. So it's, it's pretty neat. And you know, these guys have seen some pretty cool stuff. We're actually pretty lucky. We only hang with winners. Is it, Phil, is it, I don't know, a, a little bit more pressure when you're in a big city like Chicago with the Cup as opposed to being, say, on a, in a rural farm town in Canada? Well, you know what? I mean, uh, and Andrew's from Belleville. He, most guys are not from big cities, so they might play in a big city, but when you go back to their hometown, there's, uh, they're not big cities, so everybody knows everyone else. Social media, as you all know, is a way of life now, so if you're at whether you're at Andrew Shaw's house or whether you're in Sweden or wherever, in moments, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram is going crazy, and your little party in your little town has now become a big party. It's still a little town, but the whole town seems to be there. No matter where we are in the world, I uh, remember the first player I did was Colin Patterson in 1989. He, was with, he won the Calgary Flames with the Cup that year. He was at the NHL Awards, and he won a an individual trophy that night, and he said, do you think the Stanley Cup could come by my house the next morning? And this, as Mike said, was well before the guys got the cup. He was a Toronto boy, the awards was in Toronto, so I said, sure, it was about one o'clock in the morning at that time. I said, I can come by early in the morning. He said, how about eight o'clock? I said, perfect. I show up at eight o'clock, and his whole street was decorated in Stanley Cup paraphernalia, <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what house it is, and all these people are standing in front of their house. I mean, they had, it seems like they had the party set for two weeks, so. But that back then, there was no social media. It was all phone calls. Now it's, you're on, you're texting, and Andrew's party all of a sudden becomes huge. So we got we to watch that kind of stuff, too. Mm -hmm. But the small town guys, you get that small town feel, and it, it's very special. Here in Chicago, as you know, I mean, it's. It's the hockey capital of the world right now, it seems, so everybody's everywhere. And I, I think you were there a couple of Sundays ago, the WGM Radio Float, we had the cup on our float in the, the Pride Parade, so you have thousands of people on the streets on the north side, and, uh, and, and we were walking alongside the float and looking at the people's faces and how they were reacting to this. I mean, it was, it was the, certainly the, the highlight of the day, and, and I, I wonder if that's pretty typical. Where, wherever you go, do you find that, Walt, that, that, that the cup is sort of the star of the show, the main attraction? It's, uh, it's an old line we all use. We feel like we're Santa Claus bringing presents to everybody. And it's, it's nice because it doesn't cost anything. It's, it's nice because it's a trophy that everybody can relate to. And, and I don't know too many jobs in the world that you can say everybody's happy to see you. And I know they're not happy to see us. Well, maybe Phil, but um, it's a Stanley Cup, right? And it's something, I was amazed at everybody standing in line up there for four hours, but when they come to the front, nobody's complaining, nobody's angry, everybody's just happy. And, and I don't know too many jobs in the world that can, you can say that about. Why, why is that, Phil? What's, what's special about it? Why, why does it have that, that uh, effect? I, I think people? what makes it special is the guy beside me here, Andrew Shaw. He's the winner of it, so he brings it home to his family and friends. That's one of the things that makes it special, but the tradition of it, it goes back to 1892 when Lord Stanley donated it. Obviously, he didn't know what the impact would be over 120 years later, but it houses every name of every team that's won the cup, and all that tradition is right there. So when Andrew brings it home to his family and friends, he's bringing 120 years of hockey history there as well, and I think that's what makes Andrew's story add on to all the other stories his name goes on the cup with all of his heroes and all of their heroes. And as Walt said, it, I mean, it's one of the, the greatest trophies in all of sport. And it's to, to share with everybody. Andrew, you, you got your name on there at a very young age. And there are guys who play in the league for 15 years who never do. And you had a teammate this year, Kimo Tiemann, and his, he's retiring. His last game was the Stanley Cup clincher. Does it take on greater significance for you knowing that you did something early in your career that guys play their whole career to do? 
Oh, for sure, but you got to think about it as, uh, as a player. You know, you want to go to battle. You want to win that cup for, for guys like, you know, Kimo. You know, he's a, he's a great guy. You know, he, he's really well liked. He's respected to the league. And, you know, to see him play so many years and, you know, have the chance to win it in 2010 and, and lose to Chicago and, you know, then come here, you know, uh, five years later and, you know, uh, have the opportunity to do it again. And, you know, it just it helps you uh, push yourself a little bit harder to, to win it for guys like that. It, is it something, Andrew, that when you're a kid growing up in Canada on the, on the frozen pond that, that the kids pretend they're playing game seven of the Stanley Cup final and it's all about winning that cup? It, it always is. That's it's exactly uh, you know, how I grew up and I think every hockey player in the world, not just Canada, but you know, uh, as a little kid you know, having that dream to you know, one day win the Stanley Cup and you know, playing in your driveway or you know, playing on a pond somewhere with your buddies and, you know, always saying, you know, game seven, you know, winner gets the cup and, you know, it's that moment that you live for, I guess. All right, let's talk, let's talk about celebrations. After you guys won game six and beat the Tampa Bay Lightning to win the cup, and, and this had happened after game six against the Bruins and after game six against the Flyers, the cup went on a journey all over the city of Chicago. When you got back from Philly, when you got back from Boston, uh, so this time winning it here at the United Center, I know that the party went on into the, the wee hours of the morning. Do you guys, as keepers of the cup, get tired? I mean, at some point, no. these, these are young guys energized. No. We, but you just go wherever the party is, Walt? Well, I, I'm a school teacher, so I start in July and I... Boo. Hey. <laughs> so I, I've done the week after they've won and you do get tired. I mean, we can shift off a little bit, but these guys, there's like 25, 30 of them, so they take even bigger shifts, so we gotta keep going. It is, like you're going all over the place, and in Chicago, I imagine, um, being one of the original six cities, it, it's, it would be crazy, and I think Phil could attest to that even better. I guess, uh, you know, the Hawks win it in 2010. I wish you guys would have told us that you were going to win three in six years. We would have bought a condo and we could have been okay. <laughs> uh, you know what, that, that week after, you get to see all of these. You always hear about Chicago and their great restaurants and great bars. And in 2010, we thought we saw them all. Obviously, we didn't. <laughs> 2013, we saw a lot more. And now this year, there's even, I, I mean, I don't know how you guys how you choose what restaurant or what bar to go to. There's so many and they're all so good and they're all so local. It, it's a, it is a great city to be with and uh, a great organization to hang out with. It's always new bars opening in Chicago. Is, is there a curfew? Does the cup have a curfew? Me? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know what, you look at how great that Stanley Cup out looks up there, that's because it gets some sleep at night, so it, it needs its beauty sleep as well. So we usually end the night about midnight, and then we're on the road probably by seven in the morning again. Uh, you look at us, we don't look that good. Our, our sleep patterns aren't so well. But yeah, we, we usually end the night about midnight and get up the next morning. We're often flying somewhere, or we're driving, or we're, we're at the guy, same guy's house, and the party continues. It's, uh, it's always funny, because you get there, and we didn't have a curfew until about 2009, and some of the players have won it before that, and then they realize they have a curfew, and they get all like, 12 o'clock, and I say, you know what, when we get to 12 o'clock, we'll talk, and we'll see how you feel. And then I remember being with Christopher Stieg <laughs> when he first won it, and he's like, 12, ah, oh, come on. I'm like, hey, that's the way it is. And then at 12 o'clock, he's like, get this thing out of here. <laughs> uh, and his, his friends are like, come on. And he's like, no, no, Walt says it's got to go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Those are the rules. He may deny it, but that's what happened. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to Finland tomorrow. So the cup has traveled all over the world. Uh, Mike, how many countries have you seen with the Stanley Cup, would you say? Uh, I've been to 23 countries with the Stanley Cup. I think the Cup's been to 25, and I've been fortunate enough to do 23 of them. What's, what's, the, what's, that? what's the place that people would be most surprised to learn that you've been with the Cup? I'd be Afghanistan. Really? Yeah, we, we, we. And you, you've been more than once, right? 
Yeah, I've had the privilege to bring it over to the troops on three different occasions with uh, the NHL and the NHL alumni. <laughs> and to be over in that part of the world, if you told me 15, 20 years ago that I'd be uh, going to Afghanistan with the Stanley Cup, I would have thought you're crazy, but it was one of the most amazing trips that we ever did. And uh, to be over there for the men and women that are doing such a great job and making our lives so much better over here, uh, it was really rewarding. And we actually uh, we spent three days each time there and ate with a, a different group of troops for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and heard their stories. And we told hockey stories. And, uh, we had the NHL alumni play hockey against both the Canadian and, and U.S. troops, and uh, I remember our first year, we even had a missile attack our first five hours there, so you got every element that, uh, that Afghan Afghanistan has to offer, that's for sure. <laughs> they didn't tell you that when you signed up for the No, they, they, didn't, they didn't quite tell us that, but we had flat jackets and helmets. We were pretty safe. One, one thing that we seem to have seen a lot of, and maybe this is unique to the Blackhawks, Maybe it's every team that wins the cup does this. I think they all pretty much do it now, but it seems like a lot of the guys take the cup to hospitals, uh, to, to show it to veterans. Uh, Howie, maybe you can speak to that and, and how guys are using the cup to try to give something back to their communities or, or to people who, who could really use a lift. Yes, absolutely. I, I see that all the time. It's one of my favorite things that the players do do, and they take their time out of their day with the cup to uh, take it to children's hospitals and uh, try to bring a smile to uh, their faces and you know try to help them maybe in the recovery time and uh, we see them take it to the local fire departments and the police stations and try to help support them too with all the work that they do in the community and uh, it's just being able to give back I mean uh, the players too they're very fortunate I think that they're they're skilled enough to be able to play in the greatest league in the world and uh, you know they make some pretty good money doing it too but uh, they're just like us, uh, you know, they just, uh, they have values and stuff like that too and they know how they were brought up and uh, they respect everybody in their communities and they just want to be able to, to give something back to them. So it's one of the most enjoyable things that, uh, you know, we can do with the Cup too. I mean, it's all about having a bit of a party with it and that too, but uh, it's also about bringing joy and uh, some support to everybody around. Is that something, Andrew, you guys talk about? Like how you can use the, the success you've had to kind of give back? Yeah, I mean, the community you grow up in always usually supports you, you know, through your hockey career. So, you know, there's tons of people in my hometown that, you know, helped me get to where I am today. So when you have that opportunity to, to make their day with just, you know, uh, bringing the cup to them or, you know, having them experience a little bit of the day like you, you're having yourself. And, you know, you take it to, uh, I've taken it to a police station, you know, fire hall. Um, you know, I take it and done charity events. I took it to... Trenton Air Base, which is the biggest air base in Canada, which is next to my hometown. I took it there for the troops to enjoy, and you know, it's just uh, it's nice to give back to the community that you grew up in, and you know, they support you, uh, you know, through your whole career. They they still enjoy watching you. So, like I said, it's nice to to give back uh, and make their day. I guess that's great. I think we should all applaud that because that's well said. <laughs> We're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to get to your written questions. Again, if you have a question, uh, the desk over to the right, you fill out the form, and we will get your question in here. Um, I want to ask each of you in a moment, and, and Mike may have already answered this to a certain extent, about the, uh, the strangest place you've been with a cup and also the place that meant the most to you. But when you're traveling, okay, air travel has become increasingly difficult for all of us. Does... Uh, I don't know, Phil, it doesn't fit in the overhead, right? No, 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 it doesn't. Uh, you know what, it, you, you got it right, Dave. Air travel is, has, has changed a lot in the last 20 years, and obviously it's, uh, it's for safety and security and all of that, so we've got to applaud the airlines for that. But when we're taking the Stanley Cup in its case, it, it does raise some questions. Sometimes when we show up and they said, uh, what, are you, what are you checking in? And you show them this big black case. And they go, wow, that's uh, that's kind of big. It's oversized, overweight, and then you open the uh, you open it to show them, and it's a whole different story all of a sudden. They their <laughs> their cell phones come out faster than uh, anything. They're they're all taking photos, but you know what? They're they're so good with it, and they make our jobs easier because to get from place to place, we need the airlines, so we do what we can. We've uh, made friends at a lot of the airports, and obviously in Chicago, we've made some good friends here because we're here all the time. Uh, but it helps a whole bunch. 